and the green is to stop it. No, same red on okay. red on. Okay. So put it on camera and red. Yeah, that's all. And then well, let me just show you the zoom. This is the zoom. No. You see this? To be able to see this. The light is coming from somewhere. I know it's coming wrong. Mm. So W is for zoom and T is for. No, these are all here. You can start. And before I ask General Nariman to sing for supper, I will tell you what is special. Ability to speak on world war is that I personal experience. One day I was in Jaisalmer, and suddenly in the morning, somebody rang the bell and said, "Sir, abhi bahar aaye. The guard of honor is waiting for you to take their salute." So I said, "Look, the uh, innocuous poor Gujarati chap, so being asked to take salute from the army guard is a little too much." He said, "Hamne to suna." हमने तो हमेरे को मैसेज मिले कि जनरल साहब आने वाले हैं और एटर्नी जनरल एट दैट टाइम रेफर सो आई टू मेक माय बेस्ट एफर्ट टू टेक द सैल्यूट ऑफ अबाउट बट ही सेड एवरीबॉडी सब पॉलिश पॉलिश करके खड़े हैं दे विल बी डिसअपॉइंटेड सो जन लॉ ऑफिसर्स हैव अ स्पेशल केम इन जनरल एंड नोबडी बेटर देन हिम टू स्पीक ऑन अ सब्जेक्ट ऑफ हिज चॉइस बंद कर थैंक यू I don't want this to be a lecture. So, can we start in a slightly unconventional way? I want to ask you a couple of questions before I begin. First question is who according to you won World War 2? Second is who were the great army commanders of World War 2? Could I get some feedback from any of you? Army commander Patton. Right. No doubt. Thank you. Any any other answer? Montgomery. Sorry. Montgomery. Roman. Montgomery. 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 Churchill. Churchill. MacArthur. 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 The Russian who Zukov. won the battle Zukov. of Kursk. Zukov. 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 Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Yeah. Who won the war? America. America. Yes. Russia. 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 Uh, 30th January 1649, Charles the First lost his head. Charles the First of England. 30th January 1948, Mahatma Gandhi got shot. And 30th January 1933, Hitler came to power. Now, the moment Hitler came to power, one very interesting thing happened in the very next month. As most of you know, the Reichstag there caught fire. The Reichstag is the Parliament building. and some dutch crank apparently set it ablaze but the first thing that happened within a month of his accession was that all civil liberties were suspended this is a very very interesting and somewhat unknown phenomenon which took place immediately as soon as he became chancellor the other very interesting thing thing that took place within a year of his coming in was the night of the long knives now all of you must have must remember that there was his secret police called the sa to start with and ernest rome was the chief of that police rome and all the others got murdered and that gave birth to the fanatical ss should staff up it is this fanatical ss that in fact saw to it that germany was able to carry on a war for about 6 to 8 years because without this fanatical immediate bodyguard of hitler he might well have been assassinated there were as many as 17 assassination attempts on now of the 17 most of them if not all were by army people one was by some individual loner who happened to come in on november 9th which was push day and 
at the famous Munich Beer Hall, Hitler used to give a massive oration, and he did that every year from 33 onwards. And the oration usually lasted about 45 minutes. Now, this time, as luck would have it, the bomb was to go off in the 35th minute. Hitler suddenly upped and outed in the 30th minute. And in the 35th minute, the entire hall was blown up. So there may have been no Second World War because this happened immediately after the outbreak of the war in 39. The other great plot, which all of you must have heard of, is the plot where Stauffenberg, who tried three times and third time unsuccessfully. Now, that plot again was a well orchestrated plot with a lot of army generals involved. And it took place very shortly after D Day. You remember, D Day was 6 June 1944. This took place within a month and a half, 20th July. And apparently, the reason why it failed, or the reasons why it failed, are many. One was that Hitler was, in fact, in Rastenburg, which is in the Wolf's Lair, his retreat in East Prussia. It was a hot day, 20th July. And because it was hot, they got out of a stuffy room and opened various windows on the first floor. That was one very important thing that saved them, because in a closed room, the bomb that ultimately detonated would have finished everybody. The second very interesting thing that happened was that when Stauffenberg actually landed from Berlin, he had very a very short time within which to make up two bombs. Now, he went into a particular room in order to change. Field Marshal Keitel was waiting outside for him. Hitler preponed the meeting to 12.30. And as a result, he suddenly found that there was very little time to make both bombs. So he hurriedly make one, made one. And just as he was about to start the other, Keitel started banging the door and said, there's no time. So only one bomb went off. Two didn't go off. That was the second very important thing that saved Hitler's life. And of course, the third and most important thing, which all of you know, is the famous leg of the table. Mm. Because he came in, put his briefcase on this side, walked out, and Hitler was poring over some map. So another adjutant came, lifted that particular bag and put it on this side, which is what saved Hitler's life. Now, somehow or the other, this gentleman had the devil's luck, and 17 such attempts were foiled. One of them was foiled, in fact, in, a, in an airplane when he was going to fly to Rustenburg. And uh, because of the, because the aeroplane was flying reasonably high, the liquid within the bomb froze. And therefore, the bomb didn't go off. So, there may have been many possibly successful attempts, some of which were stalled by this SS, which I told you. Now, often, the SS did not allow persons in. In fact, there were several people. One was a field marshal called Witzelman, who wanted to shoot him point blank in 1941 in France. The SS commander did not allow him to come close enough for the field marshal to take a pot shot. So, we go back now to the Night of the Long Knives, the creation of the SS, which is in 1934. From 36 onwards, Hitler's Lebensraum idea came to the fore. Now, Lebensraum, literally speaking, means living space. So, he said Germans alone, being the anointed of the Lord, the same thing that the Jews tried for years and got smacked for. Being anointed of the Lord now, we require living space. The first thing he did in 1936 was to reoccupy some land which was under occupation by the Allied forces post World War I, in the middle of Germany, the Rhineland. After he did that, there was quiet and peace for some time, until in 1938, early in 1938, he walked into Austria as a, as a great liberator. All of you remember that. After he walked into Austria, the various heads of state all came together, and finally there was the infamous Munich Agreement in 1938 where Chamberlain came back saying, peace in our time. In fact, what he had done was to legitimize Hitler's walking into a completely neutral country, Czechoslovakia. 
and he walked into what was called the Sudetenland. Now, the Sudeten Germans were persons who were of German origin. They were so called Czechoslovakia, which was really Bosnia Herzegovina at the time, <coughs> for generations. So, you couldn't exactly say they were German. But then, nevertheless, he said, they are all German and we must therefore walk in. So, he walked in. And that was legitimized by the Munich Agreement. This is in all in 1938. In 39, then peace got shattered because he walked into Czechoslovakia itself in March. And finally, the curtains came down when on 1st September he walked into Poland. Now, just before walking into Poland, he actually made peace with his greatest enemy and with the one enemy he was obsessed by, which was Soviet Russia. Molotov, the, French, the foreign minister, came over and on 23rd August met Ribbentrop, who was the German foreign minister, and had this pact by which they would keep quiet so long as Poland got gobbled up equally between the two. Poland did get gobbled up and World War II began. Now, once World War II began, something very strange happened. It was called the phony war. Nothing happened. Because between September and the next April, England was expecting a great bombing. Nothing happened. There were dark nights, there were curfews, but then absolutely nothing happened. The only thing that happened, in fact, was on the high seas. And here what is interesting is, that you have two very interesting events that occurred in late 39. One was by a gentleman called Gunther Prim, who went in a U-boat. I went all alone in this U-boat and managed to go from Wilhelmshaven in Germany, dodged a couple of mines and went right into Scapa Flow, which is north of Scotland. And Scapa Flow was where the British fleet was actually stationed. He got in, then finally let loose a torpedo and broke into half an old battleship called the Royal Oak, thinking it was King George V, and then went out, managed to get out, and was greatly <coughs> decorated by Hitler. This is the first interesting event that took place once World War II was declared. The second equally interesting event took place in South America of all places. The Battle of the River Plate, and that took place in December. Because what had happened was, when the Allies laid down terms after World War I, one of the terms was that you cannot arm. And ultimately, they, they allowed Germany to rearm up to a certain extent. The extent would have allowed cruisers, but not battleships. So you could have armed up to say 6 inch or perhaps even 8 inch guns, but not 11 inch guns. So what they did was something very clever. They built three pocket battleships, they were called pocket battleships. Because each of them looked like cruisers, but in fact had 11 inch massive guns. One of them was the Graf Spee, each was named after a great German admiral. One was in fact first named the Deutschland, but then Deutschland means German. So Hitler got paranoid and said, we don't want the Deutschland to sink. See? So it must be made the Lutzau. And the third was the Admiral Scheer. Now, the Graf Spee happened to be hunting in South American waters at that point. And this is where we come home to India as well. Because there were three ships that docked the Graf Spee. English ships. The Ajax, the Achilles and the Exeter. Now, the Ajax and the Achilles were both 6-inch cruisers. The Exeter was the bigger one, 8-inch cruiser. The HMS Achilles ultimately became our flagship after the war and became our INS Delhi, which was our first flagship. So, these three ships all docked the Graf Spee and then the Graf Spee went in to refuel at Montevideo Harbor, which is in Uruguay, as all of you know. Now, Hitler was always very cheery of allowing his capital ships to go out because he realized that in sheer strength of numbers, the British Navy had a tremendous advantage. So when these three were dogging the Graf Spee and he was told that a large number of other ships from all over were coming to dog it, 
He gave orders that it should be blown up. Scuttle it. I don't want it destroyed. So exactly that was done in Montevideo Harbor. The captain, a man called Langsdorf, later shot himself. He was so upset. But one interesting postscript. This particular pocket battleship is continue to run today Montevideo. So we come back now to the phony war. We have reached the end of 39. And in April 40, one of the great disasters of the war from the British angle occurred. Because just as Churchill as first sea lord in World War I <coughs> had attempted to attack Gallipoli, which is, you know, to attack Europe from the other end and therefore try and finish the war early. And just as he found that Gallipoli ultimately turned out to be a great disaster because, fundamentally because, Kemal Ataturk and his Turks fought valiantly. And in any case, it was completely not feasible for the reason that they were at a height. So that anybody who landed could be shot below, which is exactly what happened. Churchill goofed up again. Because in April 40, he attempted to have an amphibious operation Que Norway. And you had two sea battles which were successful, but unfortunately the land troops couldn't make it. And Hitler overran Norway in April. So almost the same mistake that was made in Gallipoli was made by him again in Norway, which he had to explain later. However, events moved fast and then comes the fall of France. Now this is fantastic because France in 1999 in fact Maginot Line it was named after a minister of war, which was to fortify and strengthen the long uh, border between Germany and France. And very early, that is even before World War I, there was a general called Alfred von Schlieffen. Now Schlieffen in 1906 had in fact come out with a particular plan by which Germany could win World War I fighting on two fronts. Don't forget it feared Russia at that time much more than France. So, what he did was, he said there will be some pincer movement by which you will go in from the low countries, Belgium, Netherlands, etc. Then breach the Maginot line this way, finally meet up a little ahead of Paris and go into Paris. And the idea was we finish off France because of this pincer movement and then deal with Russia. Now, as you know, the two pincers in World War I never met. So, the whole plan went fun. But in World War II, what was let out was, and this was smart German propaganda, that they were planning to make the same mistake again. So that the Schlieffen plan then would again be executed. As a result of which, there would be an attack from one side, from the Belgium side, so that the Belgium side, North France, started getting fortified. And there would be a breach in the marginal line, in the middle. The reverse actually occurred, and this was thanks to one of the very great field marshals of the war, Field Marshal Eric von Manstein. Manstein basically had this great plan of the Panzer tanks going through the Ardennes mountains in the south. And because they could go through the Ardennes mountains in the south, the French would be caught completely unprepared and unaware. So what actually happened was everything was fortified up, thinking the Schlieffen plan will be put into force again. The opposite happened. They rolled through the Ardennes and rolled through France. The result, as you know, was foregone. France fell in something like 40 days. Now, while all this was happening in Europe, Chamberlain was finding it more and more difficult to continue as Prime Minister. Because he was Prime Minister when the war was declared. So, in a very powerful speech given by Leo Emery, Putting Cromwell said, the time has come for you to go, please go, out you go. And 10th May 1940 was the historic day on which Chamberlain had to go. Question was, who would take his place? Now, Chamberlain dearly wanted and most people dearly wanted 
our Lord Irwin uh -huh. who was who was Viceroy here and who later became Lord Halifax to succeed as Prime Minister. So he called Churchill and Halifax into a room, told them that he'll have to go that day. And then addressed a pointed question at Churchill and said, Winston, what do you say about a Prime Minister who happens to be in the House of Lords? It was a very loaded question because Halifax was in the House of Lords. Winston looked away and didn't offer an answer. Fortunately for Winston, Halifax himself said no. So Churchill became Prime Minister of England by default. Don't forget, he was a great maverick. He was not trusted by the British public. And ultimately, this great Churchill that we speak of today, had he died without a world war, would have been an absolute nobody. So 10th May 1940 is the great day on which <coughs> events moved to make him Prime Minister. On 13th, in fact, just before the 13th, one of the very few strange things I found was that immediately on becoming Prime Minister, he wrote to Kaiser Wilhelm. Now, Kaiser Wilhelm was in Amsterdam. He had got asylum in Holland and invited Kaiser Wilhelm over to England for asylum. Now, this poses a very great question mark. Why did he do it? One possible answer is Kaiser Wilhelm was half English. His mother was English, his grandmother was Queen Victoria. The other was that he was a person who had lost a world war. So, if he were granted asylum in his mother's country, and as an old man, he suddenly saw and repented, perhaps he'd have been a very important propaganda too. Now, I don't know, but this is all speculation. So, one of the very first acts on his becoming Prime Minister was to invite Kaiser Wilhelm over to England. The other, of course, was that great speech given on 13th. I have nothing to offer but blood, boil, tears and sweat. And followed, of course, by the fall of France and followed by the other great speech, victory at all costs, etc. Then begins the Battle of Britain. Now, you must remember one thing. Operation Sea Lion, which was the Battle of Britain, in fact, the, the, the German thrust towards England, to take over England, was a completely half-hearted affair. Why was it half-hearted? Hitler had great regard for the English. He had great regard for their empire. And being an imperialist himself, he felt that he didn't want to touch the old empire. There were great pickings in Europe. So, at its best, it was half-hearted. He only got incensed and gave a very famous speech in the Sports Palace Stadium. When Air Vice Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding suddenly decided that, look, we might be able to turn the madman. Because till then, they were busy bombing RAF craft in their hangars. There would have been no Battle of Britain had that continued. So, what was decided was, let us now start bombing Berlin. So, they started bombing Berlin. And the, the, the result that they foresaw ensued. The result was Hitler went mad screamed away and said that if they drop 200, 300, 400 kilogram bombs, I will drop 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And exactly that happened, but drop it where? On London. So London then took the brunt, planes were allowed to be manufactured and were able to get off the ground. This again is a very, very important thing to remember as to why ultimately the Battle of Britain was won. It was won for two reasons, according to me. One, the attempt was half-hearted. It was a sort of, you know, we are waiting really to go into Russia. The second is we don't need England. Fortress Europe was already built by then. And the third was, in any case, the British fought extremely valiant. Now, when all this took place in 1940, Hitler had really had his eyes on Russia and wanted to start a campaign in September 1940. For once, he listened to his general, who so dissuaded him and said, listen, that's too close to the winter. We'll all freeze, we won't be able. So he said, all right, we'll postpone it to the next year. So they postponed it to the next year. And in 41, the theater of war then broadened. First, it went to North Africa because the Italians had some eight almost useless divisions 
which were trying their very best to hold out against some British divisions. But then the Africa Corps under Rommel, which was just two divisions of Panzer tanks, started in February 41. And as you know, they did brilliantly until El Alamein, which was in 1942, October. Now, before we go to El Alamein, we complete this part. So, the theatre of war in 41 begins with Africa now becoming part, an integral part of World War II. And Africa was very important to Churchill because Churchill had not won a single land battle. In fact, there was a confidence in Prime Minister seems to win debate after debate but loses a battle after battle. So, he must go. The no confidence was defeated, but he desperately needed a victory. Now, that victory again came in a very strange and unexpected manner. General Gott was sent to replace General Auchinleck, who had already replaced Lord Weaver, who became our vice lord. General Gott somehow got killed in, a, in an air crash. And that is how the great Bernard Montgomery managed to come on, on the scene. He came on the scene on my birthday, 13th August, in 42. Lucky. And, lucky for him, yes. <laughs> and the moment he came on the scene, things didn't look bright at all, because Roman was just finishing these people. Roman was a tactical genius. His luck was that Rommel was ill. So that when the first battle of Alamein took place, there was a sort of impasse. And it's the second battle which the British really won. Because when it started on 23rd October, Rommel was ill in Berlin. So for four days, the battle raged without Rommel. And ill Rommel came back on the 26th. Managed for five days, something a front which should have collapsed within half a day. And ultimately had to surrender. And El Alamein then happened to be the first land victory of the British. Now, going back to 41, another very interesting thing happened. All of you have heard of the great Bismarck, not the Chancellor, the ship. Right? Now, the ship was perhaps, and I say perhaps because the only rival was the Yamato, which was a Japanese battleship, which had 18-inch guns, the largest ever. Bismarck had 15-inch. But it, it somehow was able to move at an extremely fast speed, 35 knots per hour. And its gunnery was perfect. So that when it was released as a raider in the North Atlantic on 19th May in 41, it went off the coast of Iceland and was met immediately by the Norfolk and the Suffolk who were cruisers. The Rodney was a battleship and the famous HMS Hood which was the pride of the British Navy, an old battle cruiser with 15 inch guns just like the Bismarck. One very, very interesting and early development was that the Bismarck started shooting out of range. When it shot out of range, it suddenly found that it was really attacking the ships at the back and not the ships that it wanted to attack. So that when the gunners then started adjusting their guns, one lucky shot fell straight into the magazine of the HMSO and the hood blew up. So that was a very important early victory for the Bismarck. However, by then, a large number of vessels from all over had converged to finish her. And there were those old swordfish planes, which were really reconnaissance planes, which took off from the HMS Victorious, which was an aircraft carrier at the time, and tried to do damage, didn't do much. But then finally, the same swordfish planes from the Ark Royal, which was another huge aircraft carrier, managed finally to damage its rudder. And because it damaged its rudder and the rudder got stuck, the Bismarck could only turn around in circles. So when finally it could turn only in circles, it was like a huge, massive bear being baited by many dogs and finally had to suck up. They, they actually blew it up. There again, their two admirals went down with it. Lindemann, who was the man commanding, and Latian, the same as our Latian here except it's spelled with a J. So, the Bismarck episode was one other greatly played up episode by the English at the time. 
because that was the first real victory they got. Of course, it happened to be a sea battle. And then came Russia and the great attack on Russia. Now, one very interesting thing happened. All of you have heard of Tamerlane. Tamerlane's tomb is in Samarkand. And a Russian wanted to open that tomb because he wanted to make a likeness of Tamerlane and have a statue of Tamerlane. That happened, and history doesn't seem to converge on this, either two days before or on the very day, that is 22nd June, 41, in Samarkand. As soon as he entered, he saw a curse, like the Pharaoh's curses. First curse was, whoever sets foot here and destroys me, or attempts to mutilate my bones, will be in trouble. And the second, when he actually opened the tomb, was another curse, saying that whoever opens this will find that this country will be ravaged by an invader worse than me. And somehow or the other, the invader actually came on that day itself. Another very interesting curse took place. Another very interesting thing that happened. When in fact, Tamerlane was finally buried with full honours in Soviet Russia in November 42. Remember, this was 22nd June, 41, when he was exhumed. Soviet Russia means where, where in He was buried uh, again Samar in Tashkent. No, not Tashkent. in Samarkand, in Tashkent, where you still uh -huh. find it. Right. Now, apparently, the moment he was buried and his spirit had rest, <laughs> the, the, the Russian <laughs> army suddenly started <laughs> smelling victory. See, these are some of the amazing coincidences in them. Now, of course, the moment Russia was attacked. It was attacked by three groups. You had Group A, which headed to the north, that is to St. Petersburg, which was called Leningrad. It was under a great German general called Marshal Lieb. The second was under an even greater general called Marshal Bock. And the third was under the greatest, Rundstedt and Heinz Guderian. Now, Guderian was the ultimate champion of tank warfare. He had written a couple of books, which you can read even today. And he is the only general who did not lose a single battle on the German side. He was a genius. He was Colonel General. Now, Colonel General happens to be a rank in the German army, which is just below Field Marshal. So, it is the highest form of general. It is higher than any lieutenant, major, etc. And you are in fact a sort of, you know, shadow field marshal. You are, you are sort of on your way to becoming field marshal if you are a colonel general. So, we had these three armies thrust into Russia. The thrust was extremely successful. Hitler thought everything would be over within a few weeks, as it was in Poland, as it was in France, etc. There he was completely wrong. In fact, what happened was, the entire Russian campaign got delayed. And this is another thing of great, uh, a fact of great significance. It should have started somewhere in the beginning of May. It started only on 22nd June. Reason being apparently, that Crete, Yugoslavia and Greece were proposing problems. So they wanted first to subdue this part of Europe and then start. So it got delayed. The result of delay, of course, as you know, was catastrophic because the German troops were not ready for the Russian winter. The other thing was, despite the fact that they ultimately got into a Russia which was totally unprepared for the war, Stalin kept getting missiles from the English and thought they were all false. So that suddenly you had these huge armies penetrating right into the heart of Russia and actually destroying armies. Rundstedt and the great Colonel General Guderian actually destroyed five Russian armies. Completely destroyed five Russian armies when they took Kiev, which was a city in the south. They took Smolensk. They took everything except Leningrad and Moscow. They were due to take Moscow and would have taken Moscow because Moscow, Stalin followed a scorched earth policy, retreated behind. But for some unknown reason, Hitler called back these people. 
his general and told them to go to the richer Ukraine. When finally the assault on Moscow was planned, which was 5th December, it was too late. By then the winter had settled. So the first major mistakes were made already. Leningrad was under siege. Moscow was under siege. Neither was actually captured at all in the three years of warfare between these two giants. 42 then begins. And in 42, as I told you, you had the great Battle of El Alamein. You had very great Russian victories. There is no time, unfortunately, to go into all this. Because they are victories of great detail and would take an hour by themselves. So I'll have to skip this whole thing and fast forward into 1943. Now in 43, Rommel having lost in Africa the Battle of El Alamein, first came across American troops at a place called Kasserin Pass, thrashed them in February. And the first taste of the war that the Americans got was a very bad licking. But then ultimately because of fuel really, and because there were only two divisions, and Hitler didn't spare any further divisions from Russia, it was a foregone conclusion that the Africa Corps would collapse, it collapsed by June. But despite the collapse, despite the Americans coming in, despite Soli's <coughs> general pattern, it took one year for them to go into Sicily and then Italy. Rome fell exactly one year after the Africa Corps was disbanded. And don't forget, you have a direct entry because from Africa you get into Sicily, from Sicily you get into the western part of Italy. Field Marshal Kesselring, another very great German Field Marshal, is the one who held out for over a year and managed to completely destroy both the Americans and the British at Anzio, where famous battles took place and thereafter at a place called Casa, Casa, Casa Montesino, which was a monastery which got bombed. So, virtually at the time that D-Day took place, which is 6 June 44, invasion of Europe, Rome fell. It took one year to fall. Then, of course, the great events of D-Day itself, 6 June, you had successful landings. They managed to get a foothold. And after they got that foothold, <coughs> Germany then became desperate because they had started losing on the Russian front as well. They were exhausted. Manpower was scarce. Finally, it came down to young boys who fought what was called the Great Battle of the Bulge, which took place in December 44. Three tank divisions went under three great commanders. One was Sepp Dietrich, who was an SS commander. One was General Brandenburger and one was Colonel General Hasso von Manteuffel. All three went for a thrust towards Antwerp from southern Germany. They almost succeeded. And unfortunately, as in Africa, they ran out of petrol. And because they ran out of petrol, these young boys who were commanded by these seasoned veterans, poor chaps were all finished. One very interesting took, thing took place on 1st January 45. In Belgium, at a place called Chenoin, an American massacre of German prisoners of war took place, which is a very well hidden thing. 60 German POWs were shot in cold blood by the Americans. As reprisals for American POWs being shot by Sepp Dietrich's SS forces. Then, of course, you had the final inevitable occurring. The war on two fronts couldn't continue. Germany collapsed. And after Germany collapsed, it took two massive hydrogen bombs on Japan for Japan finally to collapse. Germany collapsed in May. Japan collapsed in September. You must have noticed I've said nothing about the Eastern Front. It's not possible in this much time. So if you don't mind, kindly excuse me. Except to say that our great Subhash Chandra Bose did great work there. And Mountbatten, who also did great work, particularly in the Battle of for Infar, <laughs> committed a blunder in World War II which should have opened our eyes and told us what was coming, coming our way in 1947. In Dieppe, a place in northern France, in October 42, 
he decided to land 6,000 troops. And he said, this will be a trial run for D-Day. The trial run was a disaster. All 6,000 were mowed down. And you can still find their graves at Dieppe. Almost the same thing happened here when Mountbatten became, he was very hasty, unfortunately. And in his great haste to give us independence, we lost so many million lives. Now, the postscript. The postscript is the famous trials, one at Nuremberg, one at Tokyo. The Nuremberg trial had 24 war criminals, so-called, arraigned three of whom were actually acquitted. This is the importance of a trial. When everybody says that you must take a terrorist out of hand and shoot him, can you imagine 24 top Nazi leaders, three being completely acquitted of the four counts, basically of war crime. And the three who were acquitted were von Papen, who happened to be Chancellor pre Hitler, Yalmar Schacht, who happened to be the Chancellor of the Reich Bank, who turned the economy around for Hitler and a small information ministry official called Fritsch. But it's important, three were actually acquitted. Fourteen were hanged. Of course, some like Goering escaped the gallows by 15 minutes. And others were given life term, his poor chap was given a life term, yes, others were given 20 years, 10 years, Donitz was given 10 years, etc. The Tokyo trial is of great interest. The Nuremberg trial had three of the victors sitting as judges. And as all of you know, Justice Jackson, who was a sitting US Supreme Court judge, came as prosecutor. And Biddle, who was an attorney general, sat as a judge. They reversed roles. But what is interesting is that so far as the Tokyo trials were concerned, there were 11 judges from 11 different countries, including Australia and New Zealand, including British India, which was a Calcutta High Court judge called Radha Binodpa. He wasn't the only dissent, by the way. There were two dissents on all counts. Even the French judge dissented completely. And Radha Binodpa's dissent was that, look, could you have conceived of Hitler living and not being tried in the West? Why isn't Emperor Hirohito standing there? Makatha, one of you named Makatha, saw to it that Hirohito somehow or the other escaped her. So, the ground given was that, look, the top man is not caught. How can you catch only the henchman? Therefore, I acquit the lot. It was a 1235-page dissent, Radha Binodpa. The French judge also dissented and said that, look, you have dropped bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which is what Radha Vinodpal also said. Why are you not arraigned, the Americans, for war crimes? So these two dissented on all counts. The Filipino judge somehow went the other way. He also dissented but said that out of 28 of them, you've ordered only six hangings. Hang the lot. <laughs> so there were dissents this way, there were dissents that way. And the Dutch judge was the guy in between. <laughs> who said, I want to acquit six. But finally, there were no acquittals in the Tokyo trials. And, but there were very few hangings, six out of 28, compared to 14 out of 24 there. So finally, now we come back to the original theme, which is the victor rights history. I got various answers from you to my questions in the beginning. None of you mentioned Manstein. According to almost every single great army scholar, Manstein was the greatest field marshal of the war. Of the war. <coughs> One. Two. Only Ashok mentioned Russia. Who won the war? It is Russia who won the war. It is not England. It is not the United States. It is Russia who stood out for three years against the might of the Wehrmacht and finally turned everything at the famous battle of the Kursk salient, which was the greatest tank battle known to history, July 43. Yeah. So, that the fag end now of my talk. Thank you all very much. No.
questions. Thank you all again for your answers. I think your answers have also made it abundantly clear that the victor writes history. Because the greatest generals of the war were Manstein, Zhukov, Konyev, Rokossovsky, three Russians, and any number of Germans. What about Americans? Rundstedt. Americans came at a stage when everybody was fagged out and there were young people. What about Japanese? Patton was undoubtedly a great general. But Patton didn't have to do much. He came at the fag end. Eisenhower only happened to be the coordinator of the forces, which ultimately went in. What about Montgomery? Montgomery again fought in the smallest theater of the war, Africa. And turned the tide for England, but didn't turn the tide of the war by any means. Because I told you that it took them one year after El Alamein, in fact, one and a half years after El Alamein, for them to come up to Rome and even reach Rome because of another great field marshal, Kesali. Yamamoto? So you had all these great German generals, yeah. none of whom are known. Japanese. And Russia, in fact, won the war. Ashok Desa is absolutely correct. Thank you all very much. Now, any questions? <laughs> any any questions? Want peace, George Marshall. Perhaps. Ah. Perhaps. Yeah. See, I want to ask you. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, one thing which has mystified, for which I have not had good uh, satisfactory answers, or one likes to the history of the war, is why did Hess, who was the deputy Führer, escape to England when Germany was on the triumphant march? Very good question. He did it apparently because he knew that Hitler loved the English. Huh. He was upset that the English kept attacking him. And he thought he could broker a peace between England and Germany and therefore do the, do the greatest thing for his Europe. Of course, he happened to be mentally unstable as well, <laughs> as most of the Nazi people were. You know, of course, when they took their uh, IQs, most of them were found to be below average. <laughs> Goering was found to be near brilliant. I see. Yes. But short of Goering, people like Stryker, etc., were actually found to be near moron level. Yeah. Why have you mentioned Dunkirk? Sorry? Why have you not mentioned Dunkirk? You see, one can't mention everything. <laughs> there is so much I have not mentioned, I could give you another speech. <laughs> Nobody, wants another Nobody wants that. I could speak for another hour. Who was the German who asked the nation that, uh, oh. commander to surrender and he said nuts? Ah, of course. Yeah, correct, correct. Nuts, sir. Yeah, yeah, nuts. Quite right. That was in the Ardennes office. In the Ardennes. Sorry? The town in Belgium where they had that. Did I want to go there? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Question. What is the name of the town? Belgium, ma. Yeah. They put the stiff resistance. I forget the name. Yes, yes, yes. Escape me as well. Surrender? Surrender? Yeah, but the leader, apparently the leader who said nuts was Brandenburger. I see. Yeah. The general who said nuts, yeah. Right. Very good. Thank you very much. See, I, must, I must tell you only one small thing. Time for a drink. That uh, like a good senior, Venu has come just in time. <laughs> Mark is brief. <laughs> All right. I was, I, this is a little small token of our... Like affection. a good senior, he's come just in time for a drink. <laughs> <laughs> token of our affection. How sweet. Thank you very much. Thank this you. book has nothing Thank you. to do with more. Thank you. Sanaya, Thank you. congratulations Thank you. again and again and we are very proud of you. Uh, I love to. Thank you. One of the most remarkable yeah, things about the speech we heard was not only the memory of various names, but dates. And uh, it uh, is a warning to Sanaya in a very different way. <laughs> the story of Mullah Nasruddin who went to the Hakim and said, I am very worried about the memory of my wife. So the Mullah said, why? What's happening? Does she forget? said, no, 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 she doesn't forget. You <laughs> 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 somebody who doesn't forget. <laughs> One better is the football. Uh, <laughs> they learn nothing and forget nothing. <laughs> <laughs> we must thank him thank and you. now you are all waiting for your past.
Take your pass, throat, yeah, speak, make, an, yeah. make an attack for the, for the train. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you feel also. You have to carry this. I'm keeping it there.